Hello. All right, attention chiropractors, slayers of subluxation, unleashers of the imprisoned impulse. I'm Dr. Anthony Pellegrino from ChiroEdge, and welcome to this week's edition of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown, where each week we, <clears throat> excuse me, ammo you with the, uh, provide you with the ammo and certainty necessary to change the health of your community from the inside out. We've got an exciting day for you today because we kick off Heart Health Month which is awesome. Uh, each week we're going to be reviewing one article that uh, discusses chiropractic and uh, cardiovascular disease, the heart, the cardiovascular system, etc., which is great. So we've got that for you today. Uh, we've also going to go ahead and we're going to be breaking down some research on kiddos and bilateral ear infections. And we're also going to go ahead and hammer some research for you guys on... Uh, a case study on brain injury and whiplash following an accident that resulted in headaches, neck pain, and vertigo, and go into some mechanism there about why chiropractic has to do with the brain and not just like bone on nerve, which is awesome. So while we're diving into this, um, you guys can go ahead and always get this information straight to your inbox uh, in patient newsletter format, which is the whole point of this in the first place, being able to empower our community to be educated and to refer. And you can do that by going to ChiroEdgeMedia.com. Um, if you just kind of wanted to dabble a little bit, what we also wanted to do is we believe in helping uh, chiropractors reach their community in different ways. So we've put together a free year of social media for you guys, where each week you'll go ahead and get a couple social media memes from us um, for you to use for your community with some breakdowns on that. So you can do that at ChiroEdgeMedia.com slash social. So we're going to start off kicking off Heart Health Month here by diving into a case study uh, that was published in 2014 in the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research. It's called Reduction in Cardiovascular Disease Risk Factors Following Chiropractic Care, a Case Study and Review of the Literature. Uh, I like this and I wanted to start off with this because I wanted to talk about um, about some different risk factors and we dive into this case study and you know I'm going to talk about what I like about it what I don't as well. Uh, so some background uh, cardiovascular disease if you don't know is the leading cause of mortality and a major cause of morbidity in the world. More than 80 million Americans are diagnosed and inflammation is often a common factor. To sum up this study uh, the author said that chiropractic that this described chiropractic management of a patient with vertebral and lower extremity subluxations and a chief complaint of hypercholesterolemia and hypertriglyceridemia along with ancillary complaints of gout and secondary low back pain are discussed within the context context of this study so this is a 30 year old male which uh, to me is pretty crazy because i if I'm recording this on Tuesday, February 5th, and I turned 30 yesterday. So happy birthday to me. Yes, I feel old. Moving on. This 30-year-old male uh, is suffering with hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglycerides. He has low back pain, and he has gout, and he's been suffering with this stuff for four years. He'd been described, he was prescribed simvastatin for his cholesterol, allopurinol for his gout, uh, they actually did a pretty thorough um, physical initial exam, including motion and static palpation, posture, orthopedic tests, neuro, neuro, neurological tests, deep tendon reflexes in upper and lower extremities, and they did thermography. But they have no mention of x-rays. Oh, well. Okay. They say on the value of thermography, the dysfunction of the sympathetic nerves innervating the vascular beds of the skin demonstrates asymmetrical deviations in skin temperature, which has been reported in a plethora of health problems, including involvement of peripheral nerves. All, 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 all right. Subluxation is going to cause contraction of the uh, vascular beds on the surface of the skin, uh, which is going to cause one side to be hotter or colder. Uh, I like that they're not just doing and saying like, oh, well, a nerve gets hot when there's pressure on it. But, you know, because <laughs> heard, heard people say that or people say some some crazy things. But, you know, that, that's true. 
So the frequency of care they did for this guy was they did three times a week for three weeks, and then they saw him uh, one time a week for one to two times a week for six weeks. They also made dietary changes, nutritional changes, exercise. They adjusted the guy, diversified. Um, based on their description, it wasn't a flying seven, uh, which is great. Also, it might not have been the most specific, being that we didn't have things like x-rays. Um, they were just kind of feeling for, at least feeling for and analyzing where that motion and static palpation wasn't 100% adjusting, adjusting based on that, which is way better than a lot of the studies that we review on here, which is just like, oh, hey, uh, I, I, I just moved the atlas on the left, and I compared it to when I moved it on the right. Um, but it's like, well, you didn't actually do any analysis. So at least they, 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 they did an assessment, uh, or, and they, they adjusted based on what they found was subluxated and not just randomly, which is awesome. So they saw big changes in the objective indicators of subluxation, uh, which, which, um, which is important. They saw big changes in static and motion palpation, saw big changes in thermal symmetry. And quite frankly, say whatever you want about technique or diversified. If you're getting changes in the objective indicator of subluxation, that's all that matters. If you're checking to make sure that this person is less subluxated, I don't care if you hit them on the butt with a shovel. If they're less subluxated and you can prove it, you did a good job. So kudos to you guys. That's awesome. So as they went through, saw not only these changes in, uh, and as they went through, adjusted this guy over the course of nine weeks, they saw not only changes in uh, objective indicators of sub subluxation, but they say that under the discretion of his general practitioner, the patient discontinued usage of prescribed statin and allopurinol and went from being obese to overweight based on BMI, which is awesome, right? So we saw huge changes in the hypercholesterolemia and the hypertriglyceridemia, and those are both risk factors for future cardiovascular disease. So at 30 years old, why this guy may have not have been diagnosed with heart disease at this point, he was certainly well on his way. So what they literally did was they changed the trajectory of this guy's health. They removed some of these risk factors and said, now he's going to be less likely to be able to, to uh, he's going to be less likely to develop this issue over time. Well, that's awesome. What, uh, when we talk about mechanism, they go ahead and they state the subluxation, subluxation may affect the rate, the rhythm, and the power of the heart contraction through, through sympathetic efferent nerves originating from T1 to T5. Okay, Cervical subluxation at any level could also affect sympathetic uh, efferent pathways to the heart by the superior cervical middle, middle Sorry, by the superior cervical middle, cervical and stellate ganglia, afferent and parasympathetic efferent innervation to the heart could also be dis uh, disturbed by upper cervical subluxation, primarily because of the passage of the vagus nerve through the jugular foramen. Uh, yes, and I just think that there's, there's more. And when we're going to look at this, I think that uh, if you guys don't know who Dan Sullivan is, um, Dr. Dan Sullivan, the chiropractic certainty advocate, uh, I think he does a really, really, really good job of helping people. He has this whole like back to the brain program, which I really like. I really like the concept of it. I haven't taken it myself, but his whole thing is moving people to the subluxation instead of just being a, a, set, a spinal cord and nerve thing, but saying that we're literally going to go ahead and affect, subluxation affects the function of the brain. And we know that that is true and I just think that there's when we're going to be describing this mechanism in studies I, I just want to see more studies actually get to the afferent pathways not only just affecting the the afferent pathways not only just affecting like the uh, sympathetic parasympathetic system but literally looking at how that's going to bombard the frontal cortex it's going to affect the amygdala it's going to affect the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis the HPA axis and I really just want to see us get more into that and see the subluxation is not only going to affect the nerves that come from this area the heart isn't only going to be affected by these sympathetic efferent pathways from, from, from T1 to T5 but we're literally going to change the, the, the way that the brain is able to perceive the body because it's receiving garbage information so while the brain and the nervous system are actually responding correctly, they're responding to improper information. And that's the reason that we have this cardiovascular disease. That's the reason. 
that we have these heart disorders. And I really want to see us just kind of go go back to that. Um, I really want to see us just really dive in to how subluxation affects the brain. And luckily, if you hang till the end, I think this third study that we're going to go through, uh, this is a functional neuro guy who goes through brain injury and goes through chiropractic care. And he really does a good job, I think, discussing how the brain is actually affected with subluxation. We're going to dive right into that mechanism. So I want to notice right, I want you to notice right now when we kind of go through this, how, how you feel, right? You may be excited um, that subluxation can affect something like cardiovascular disease and that we're describing that. Uh, if you're anything like me, that's just something that's really important because we see it all the time, right? And uh, you, you might have that, but you also might not. Um, and I kind of throw up my hands with a study like this and I'm like, all right, awesome. It's a case study and the grand scheme of things, it's not supposed to be conclusive or powerful, but it's just meh, right? It's just, that's, the, it's meh. Was this change because of subluxation, because of the adjustment, or was it because of dietary and, and lifestyle and exercise changes? I, I don't, I don't know. And since this is a case study, I mean, we're talking about this individual person's life. So does it matter where the change came from for him? No, it doesn't. But when we're putting this in a journal, like the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research, if you were to walk up to somebody on the street and say, hey, if you are obese, if you have bad cholesterol, if you have bad triglycerides, do you think that diet and exercise is going to help? they're going to say, yeah, of course it's going to help. I don't know anybody who would disagree with that. If you say, do you think that getting adjusted to make sure that your brain can properly control and coordinate the function of every system in the entire body, such as your cardiovascular system, do you think that that's important as well? They're going to say, no, what the heck does chiropractic have to do with my heart? I don't have neck pain. So it's like, what, what is this actually doing? What actually ch caused the change? Well, I wanted you just kind of sit with that and, and think about it and think about the way that we're communicating in each of our practices. Think about the way that we communicate to our community and think about where we're putting our focus. If you're listening to this for the first time, uh, a little um, clue into my life is I love correcting subluxation and I really don't care about anything else. If you're listening to this for the second time or more, chances are you knew that, and chances are you probably do the same too. Um, because I, I just think that chiropractic is flipping amazing, and I think that we can just do a really, 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 really much better job correcting subluxation and talking to people about subluxation. And if we think that somebody needs to make a diet or lifestyle change, I think there's people who are amazing that we can refer to out in the community, but we really shouldn't be mixing and we really shouldn't be watering down this message of, yeah, you need to get this checked, but you need to get your diet and lifestyle under control but you need to get make sure that you're getting adjusted as well. And this is the one thing that I'm excellent at, right? Uh, if you guys have kids in the car, I'm going to uh, say, you're, just skip forward like one minute because I'm going to tell a story and it's going to be a little funky. Uh, when I was a child, like second, third grade, I had a varicocele uh, and I had a varicocelectomy. So essentially I had a surgery uh, on my nuts. There it is. And long, st uh, they're perfect. They're fine now. They're working great. I mean, I don't have kids yet, but we haven't tried. So who knows, but they're, they're doing okay. Uh, they work fine. Moving forward. When <laughs> I went, can't believe I'm telling this, you guys, this story. I can believe it. I'm crazy. Uh, I remember so specifically, I was in like third grade, fifth grade. I think it was fifth grade. I was in fifth grade. And my younger brother, four years younger than my brother, Matt, came with me to, uh, to an appointment. And his wrist hurt him. So he wasn't there for, like, the exam or anything. That would be weird. But he was just there because it was, like, a day off. My dad did to get, took a day off. And, like, he was, uh, I guess, out of school. Whatever. Summertime. Whatever. He came for the appointment. And he went ahead and he asked the doctor. And he said, hey, doc. <laughs> hey, doc. My, my wrist really hurts. Can you take a look at it? 
And the doctor looked at him. This I was in fifth grade, so he was in first grade at the time because he's four years younger than me. And he goes, Matt, I want to let you know. And I'll remember this for the rest of my life. He goes, Matt, I want to let you know. I don't know wrists. I only know penises. <laughs> I remember that to this day. And it's like, I just want to say that to people. You know, I just want to be like, guys, the guy has his medical degree. You know, the guy has his medical degree. He did a rotation probably in orthopedics. He probably knows a lot about the wrist. He probably knows more than anybody else in the room about the wrist. But he knows oh, more than anyone else in the county about penises. So he sticks there, and if somebody has a question about the wrist, he refers them to a specialist in the wrist because he values what he does enough to say, listen, this is the one thing that I know more than anybody else on, so this is the one thing I'm going to talk about. If you want to get advice on a wrist, go to somebody who's going to give you advice on a wrist. I'm going to tell you about your penis. And I wish the chiropractors would just know the nervous system. And that's it. I just wish that we know we know more than anybody else in the room about nutrition, about exercise. We know more than anybody else in the room at that time, but that's not what we're experts at. And I wish that we were just experts at one thing. Well, we recognize that. Woo! Now for a more recent study, January 14th, 2019, Journal of Pediatric Maternal and Family Health, Dr. Paige Simon and Joel Alcantara. Whenever you see that man's name, Dr. Joel Alcantara, you know I'm about to get excited. Resolution of chronic recurrent bilateral ear infections following chiropractic care in a one-year-old infant. Background stats you should know, before the age of three, 80% of children will experience at least one episode of ear infections. And by five years, 40% of children Five years old, 40% of children will have multiple recurring ear infections. Concerned with the, by, concerned parents, uh, concerned by parents with their child's pain, dis disturbed sleep, and irritability, combined with a wait and see medical approach, has motivated parents to seek alternative health care for their child. Chiropractic care is the most popular and highly sought after of practitioner based therapies for parents looking for alternatives with ear infections. So a one-year-old infant brought in after suffering with four bilateral ear infections over the course of five months after each antibiotic use, symptoms would resolve but would return within one month. The kiddo also had frequent colds, sinus congestion, and food allergies. He was born at 37 weeks via scheduled cesarean section. Birth trauma. They assess, assess and adjusting using toggle in the upper cervical area and then Logan once that cleared for one to two times a week for six weeks. It's pretty similar to how I adjust kids in my office. That made me happy. Then they went to one to two visits a month for three months. At the six-month marks, parents reported that she had not had an ear infection or symptoms of an ear infection since beginning care. They also reported that she had significant improvements in mental development, flexibility, sleep, and coordination. She also saw a decrease in the frequency of cold and allergy symptoms, and she also saw that her irritability had resolved. Why all is all of this important? Is because chiropractic is not a treatment for ear infections. I swear, when I hear somebody says say that like they see kids for ear infections, it makes me want to rip all of my hair out because we don't. What we do is we correct the nervous system on a salutogenic model. We do not just fix the the get. It's just get to the root cause of ear infections. Yes, but that's not what we do. We correct anything that's going to stop the body from healing and functioning 100%. Oftentimes, does that do ear infections resolve? Yes. But we're making positive decisions to promote health on a daily basis. Positive decisions to promote health on a daily basis to simply allow the kiddo to heal and function better for the simple reason of healing and functioning better. When that is the approach that we take, if they're going to heal and function better, they are going to have an increase in mental development because the nervous system, obviously, the brain is responsible for mental development. Are they going to have an increase in flexibility? Yes, probably. Are they going to sleep better? Most likely, yes. Are they going to be coordinated better? Probably, yes, because the nervous system adapts to every stimulus that comes our way. If you adjust for any one of those things individually, you're not doing chiropractic care. You're doing allopathy. You're doing a treatment and you're doing a therapy. If you're correcting subluxation for the sake of correcting subluxation, that is what chiropractic care is.
Now from January 19th in the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research, we do resolution of vertigo, neck pain, and headaches following chiropractic care, a case study and review of the literature. So in this study, we're going to highlight the effective management of a patient suffering with whiplash disorders, which included severe vertigo, headaches, and neck pain. Important stats for you to know, 1.7 million civilians suffer, a traumatic, suffer from a traumatic brain injury. 35% of U.S. adults over the age of 40 have vestibular dysfunction. That number to me is astounding. 35% of people over 40. To quote the article, for all intents and purposes, we consider whiplash injuries to be in the same realm as a traumatic brain injury. And there is subsequent traumatic changes to the brain as a consequence of whiplash injury. Yes, 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 yes. Those who suffer a TBI often experience sensory motor deficits, disequilibrium, and vertigo. The rationale behind how whiplash injuries cause vertigo is based on the idea that post-traumatic modifications in the proprioceptive input along with neck pain will alter the proprioceptive input to the cerebellum and cause subsequent damage to the vestibular spinal reflex. Welcome to disaffrontation, my friends. Research has shown that the brain will literally alter its physiology and even its morphology following traumatic and non-traumatic neck pain. Post-traumatic neck injury can also cause a decrease in gray matter volume in the anterior cingulate cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex after only three months post-trauma. Literally, in the presence of a whiplash injury, the brain can start to degrade. These parts of the brain are what's important for pain perception, for cognition, for executive function, and for motor planning. So this 44-year-old female with a chief complaint of vertigo, neck pain, and headaches had, uh, came into this chiropractic office after it had been affecting her for three years. She came in a year after the injury, then she stopped, and then she came back three years later. She came in simply seeking neck pain release, relief. Which is why we need to educate, 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 educate. If she didn't have neck pain, do you think that maybe she should still get checked for subluxation following a traumatic whiplash injury? Yes, we need to educate, and it's our job to do it, and that's the reason you're listening to this. She got hit from behind. She didn't hit her head, but she felt dizzy, and she had high blood pressure afterwards. Over time, the neck pain, vertigo, and headaches came about, which she never experienced previously. She experienced dizziness every night for five minutes with severe occurrences every single night. The severe occurrences happened up to three hours. Headaches were 7 out of 10 to 10 out of 10. They went from her temples down to her neck. They happened about every day and lasted about four to five hours. The neck pain was constant. It was sharp. It was radiating into her head, radiating into her head and making it feel like her head was going to explode. They cared for her using activator and functional neurology. She couldn't do a Romberg's test prior to care, where she'd stand with her feet together and close her eyes. She'd fall right, after, right away. After nine visits, she could do a Romberg's for 93 seconds. Vertigo went from nightly to once a week. Her neck pain and headaches decreased frequency and severity, which went from constant to being able to go days without discomfort following adjustments. So from the article describing the mechanism, I'm a big fan of that. It's been widely accepted that in the chiropractic field that there are nervous system changes as a result of the adjustment. Multiple studies show cervical spine manipulations ugh, alter the sensory motor integrations between the parietal and frontal lobe. This is the pros proposed mechanism behind the therapeutic effects of the adjustment. Pain perception is altered due to proper reintegration uh, of the proprioception of the cervical spine. Uh, one thing that we need to kind of look at here, they're describing the adjustment as uh, putting a positive input into the brain, which, yes, it is. What I want to clarify though, there, though, is that the adjustment not only puts a positive input into the brain, I feel as though what's even more important, and you can debate me on the importance of it, is that we're also correcting aberrant or improper proprioceptive information that's going to the brain. So, yes, we're putting in a good stimulus, but we're correcting a bad one. Muscle spindles and Golgi tendon afferin fibers are the nerve fibers that have been found to be impacted and stimulated by a cervical spine manipulation. This is how it affects the brain. In summary, the whiplash injury will cause negative neuroplasticity in the brain due to altered proprioception from cervical subluxation as a result of injury. Chiropractic care reduces aberrant or improper information and puts good information up to the brain. It does both, both simultaneously. You can't have one without the other. 
The adjustment has the ability to affect the brain and nervous system. Also, dysfunctional proprioceptive input from the spine can cause negative neuroplastic changes to the brain. Here's where they're going to go ahead and talk about removing that negative input. Therefore, we can surmise that chiropractic can remedy the altered mapping and proprioceptive input caused by subluxated vertebra and create long-term positive plastic changes. This is the core foundation of the disaffrontation model. Biomechanical dysfunction leading to altered perception of the dysfunctional area, changing the way the integration of that part of the brain will consequently result in improper motor put, uh, output. Simply put, this model can be summarized as garbage in, garbage out. This is what we were talking about earlier in the beginning when we talked about how um, the nervous system is responding appropriately. The brain is doing what it should do. It's just doing it based off of having improper information. The patient was suffering with garbage sensory input from her cervical spine, which has re resulted in an inappropriate output, manifesting as vertigo, inaccurate eye movements, and proper, possibly hypertension. When you correct the dysfunction, the body can heal. So I'm super pumped to share with you guys today. Uh, we, in this last article, talk about this dis, uh, disaffrontation model. If you haven't read Christopher Kent's four-dimensional model of subluxation, you can find that in an old edition of Dynamic Chiropractor when they actually used to talk about real chiropractic, and he used to write for them, uh, breaking it down as simple as possible. It breaks down chiropractic into four different components, okay, based on subluxation of four different components. The first is dyskinesia, which is improper motion, improper movement, improper positioning of the spine. Dyskinesia, improper movement. So many people think that that's all that chiropractic is, and they think that subluxation doesn't exist because they only think about the misaligned vertebra itself. But because the spine is riddled with mechanoreceptors, receptors, especially in the neck, has muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, there's nerves that interface the discs, there's mechanoreceptors inside the cervical facets, what's going to happen with dyskinesia, or that improper motion, motion or movement of the spine, it's going to send afferent signals from the nerves, from the spine, up to the brain, that's going to affect everything from the frontal cortex, the amygdala, the cerebellum, the brainstem, which we discussed here. That's disaffrontation, the, muscle, the nerves going up. The last two components of this model are, uh, it was dyskinesia, disaffrontation. They're dyspinesis, which is going to be the improper, excuse me, the improper muscular control, postural control of the body uh, was because of this disaffrontation, because the brain is responding appropriately, but it's responding based off wrong information, right? If I touched my computer here and it felt like it was a thousand degrees, I'm going to pull my hand away because it's hot. Even though it's not a thousand degrees, my brain did the right thing because it thought that it was hot. It's just not. It got the wrong information, right? Imagine if you had, if you tried to buy, you know, you tried to buy uh, stocks based off of the last hundred years of, of the, in, I don't know nothing about this, but imagine you tried to, you know, buy finance, like stocks based off the last hundred years of data and the last hundred years of data you got was wrong. It wasn't the right stuff. Maybe you made the right decisions based on the data that you got, but you're not making the right decisions based off of what actually happened. Okay, so that's dyspinesis, and also it's going to cause an effect on the autonomic system called dysautonomia. Uh, that's going to put us into that fight or flight state. Uh, it's going to put us more into the parasympathetic system or more in, into the sympathetic system. I find it more often as the sympathetic system, but we use something like HRV and thermal technology to measure that. Anyway, this was another edition of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Pellegrino from CairoEdge. You guys can once again get all of this information in patient education newsletter format by going to our website at chiroedgemedia.com. You could also go ahead and pick up a full year of free chiropractic social media posts at chiroedgemedia.com social. I will catch you all next week.